Well, man, so Clay Ferro, another Miami Sports Pod and another Dolphins preseason game. Clay, the only difference is this time we got to see Tua Tungvaloa play. Uh, didn't play much, six of eight. Mike McDaniel decided right before the game he wasn't going to play Tyree Kill, so we didn't get to see the Hill to a combination. And go figure, it's another quarterback, Skylar Thompson, who we talked about last week, who stole the show again. But let's get to Tua. Uh, were you happy what you saw from Tua? Is that enough for the preseason? Okay, finish you know practices and gear up for week one. Yeah, I was fine with that, and we actually talked about this last week. It, it really didn't make much of a difference to me whether he, he played at all, because I think you see enough during joint practices when you're going up against the Tampa Bay Bucks. We're going to have more coming up this week with Philly. A lot of times the good on good that you get there is even better, but I understand the feeling that you do want to get him out there in a game like situation. So I can see both sides of it, but I liked how in command he seemed to be of the mm -hmm. offense. I liked how quickly – he executed everything. He went through his decisions really quickly. Now, obviously, when you're going up against a defense that isn't scheming, isn't necessarily game planning, then that's not going to be into the equation. And a lot, of, a lot can, of second and third stringers, too. I mean, let's be honest. Sure, but you can only deal with the hand that you're dealt, right? So I, I thought it was fine. I, I didn't think you would have wanted any more out of it other than the offensive line playing a little bit better. But uh, it seemed fine to me. I'm glad he played. Uh, you and I differed a bit on that one. You were kind of like, and I remember you saying, I really don't care if he doesn't play. And I understood why in the sense of getting that work that you talked about, joint practices and training camp, working with his teammates. But to me, game situations, even as vanilla as they are in preseason, as simple as the, as simplified as the offense is, that you're not showing much. Uh, I still think just getting out on that field with your teammates, making a couple plays, safe passes, I think it was six of eight under 60 yards, it didn't make any real mistakes. Didn't have Tyree Kill again or Jalen Waddell, who missed as well with a minor injury. So it's hard to really gauge, and I don't think anybody was truly going to judge. It's not like I – mean, then again, let me let me say this and know the society we live in now with social media. <laughs> Everybody's I was going to say it's, it's not like if anyone was going to make a big deal out of Tua having a bad night if he did, but that's not true. People would have made a big deal out of it. <laughs> yeah. But they also would have made a big – if he had a great night. You know, if he had thrown two touchdowns yeah. and two possessions and, and you know, looked great – I thought he looked fine. Again, you're going to have vanilla game plans. That's just the way it is. Uh, you know, when you look at the big picture of Tua, he's your starting quarterback. You know what it is. And we're not going to get a real feel of how this season goes for him until you get into that work in the regular season with Tyreek Hill, with Jalen Waddle. What is Mike Gesicki? You know, what's his role in this offense that we'll touch on in a bit? How your offensive line comes together. And then obviously the production that he has overall. But I think on this night, you know, Tua's night was simple. The running game, though, you referenced the offensive line. The running game struggled again, you know, and I think that's something yeah. where Mike McDaniel, I don't know if it's something that he's, I don't think he's giving too much thought into it. Like, I don't think it's something that he's, and he and he said it post game. He's like, look, there are things that we want to improve, but we're, we learn from it. It's, 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 that's the reason that it's, it's preseason. But I think there has to be a sense of, you know, I wonder what's going on here. Like, I wonder what, why is it that this is, is happening right now? Because they are struggling a bit and it's frustrating to see. Now, are, are you talking about when you say what's happening right now? Are you talking about your pictures not loading onto the onto the the thing? Oh, <laughs> oh, is there? Oh, well, let me let me see what I got here. I, I don't even know what I got here. Hold on. You want, you you want video? Like loading them. No. It, oh, you want video? Hold on. You want video? Hold on. What, what I got? There you I go. Had to throw you under the bus. I had to throw you, you want under that? The bus on that one. There you go. There you go. No, I look. I. Yes, that's disappointing. It's extremely disappointing. And, and this is going to get us around to, I think, what's going to be a big topic of conversation for the next week and maybe beyond. And that's Mike Gesicki. And you need a tight end in this offense who can block. And, and in particular, block in the running game. You can't have a tight end out there who's going to be a tell. So, yeah, yeah the offensive line struggled. And, yes, Teron Armstead wasn't playing. And, and maybe they weren't scheming up to – get on the perimeter and do a whole lot. But you would have liked to have seen them at least win the blocks that they had in front of them. And you really would have liked to see Mike Gesicki get involved blocking a little bit better. And, you know, he had the the whiff, what appeared to be a whiff on the, the, the safety with Teddy Bridgewater. So, you know, the running game blocking was a problem. I, I do think that when you look at San Francisco's offense, for example, you know, we see the highlights of George Kittle and how great he is running after the catch, you know, so good in the passing game. That guy is a phenomenal blocker and a reason why they're able to do so much in the running game. And I don't know if you can have a running attack in this offense where a tight end can't block. And so I, I don't know that this is I, 
I think Mike Gesicki could really help a team. I yeah. don't know how much he's going to help this team with his skill set. It's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, look, I think the big picture on the offensive line is that you don't have Teron Armstead yet. I think I think you're going to see other guys and what Connor Williams and these guys. I mean, I think it's too early to really pinpoint. Sure, you want to play better as an offensive line. Um, you want to give your your running backs, whoever's in there, an opportunity to run. That hasn't been the case so far in the preseason. Certainly wasn't the case on Saturday night. But I think to your point on Mike Kosicki, look, Mike Kosicki is really a, a wide receiver. I mean, he, he really yep. is a wide receiver type that could – find mismatches and that's the way he's had success in this league and that's why he's been a fairly productive tight end let's face it, it's not like Mike Kosicki some s- scrub who's barely played or produced I mean he's he looked like he was an ascending player but when a new regime comes in and they have their plan they have their style of player they have their style of idea and I think it's pretty clear that Mike Kosicki doesn't fit their style he just doesn't to your point with this inability to really block consistently and you know McDaniel I thought it was interesting McDaniel said after the game that Kosicki wanted that extra work because he wants to show and improve. And Gasicki himself said, Hey, I want to be out there. I want, you know, they want me to block more. I've got to be more of a natural tight end who stays in there blocking and, 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 you know, gets that kind of tight end production as opposed to the tight end that he was, which again was sort of a, a wide receiver type role that you look for mismatches. But Clay, I just don't see it working. I, I don't, I don't, you know, he's got the franchise tag on him. I think he's valuable to your point. I think he could help someone else. I wonder, and I didn't think this two weeks ago, but I really think it now. I wonder if they're going to try to pull some sort of deal before the season because you're going to go into the season and there's two things that are going to happen, right? Either you're going to wait on Gasicki and somehow he's going to turn the corner and become a, a serviceable blocker, right? And and it's okay. Or he's not. And then you're stuck with this guy who you really don't know how to use, doesn't do what you really need him to do consistently enough. And I think it'll sort of be a distraction. And what do you really do with a guy that you're playing the franchise tag cost on a tight end who's not filling the role that you need? No, I that's the and, big question. And I, I think we talked about the importance of this year in particular. Hey, we need to figure out if Tua Tagovailo is our franchise quarterback. And mm-hmm. and obviously, there's a lot more that goes into this, but. What helps Tua Tungavailoa more? A really good pass-catching tight end slash receiver flex type player mm-hmm. or a running game? And I, I know that may be oversimplifying it, but Tua never, has never had a running game since he's been in the NFL uh, no. at, at all. And yeah. I, the Dolphins, you could say for a long time, have been struggled to run the football. So to me... In this offense, the, the best friend of Tua Tungavailoa is not going to be Tyreek Hill. It's not going to be a, a really good pass blocking, <clears throat> excuse me, offensive line. Tua's best friend is going to be a running game yeah. that throws off the defense to where they don't know what's coming. And unfortunately, Takes pressure off. if you put Gasicki out there, it's a tell. The other team's going to know your pass. At this point, it is. At this point, it is because I know he's trying, and McDaniel said it pretty much. He said, look, Mike's got some things he's got to work on. I mean, there's he's showing improvement, but there's some things he'll tell you he needs to be better about. To me, when a coach says that, and a player, again, we're talking about an established player. This isn't a rookie. This isn't a second-year player who's finding his way. But it almost feels like a sick. He is a rookie because he's a rookie to this regime. He's the first time with this regime, and he doesn't have whatever is on his resume, which, again, has been pretty impressive. Uh, isn't enough to just say to the coaches, throw him in there. He's our guy. And, I, and I'm sorry to think he's not. Now, the preseason. No, and, and look, and, and, and not to cut you off, sorry, but, but no. I want to make one more point about this with Gasicki. He, he could really help a team. His skill Absolutely. set, man, there are a lot of teams in the NFL that could use that. But if you're throwing him the football, if you're drawing up a play for him, it's, it's a play that Tyreek Hill doesn't get, it's a play that Jalen Waddell doesn't get. And you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a good problem to have with the Dolphins right now, but you've got too many players who are more explosive with the ball in their hands than Mike Gesicki. Now, it, Jimmy Graham was an awful blocker. And, you know, I'm a Saints fan. Jimmy Graham was phenomenal with how Sean Payton used him in that offense, but they didn't need him to go out there and block. When he was out there, yeah, you he's could a use freak him show. Kind of as a yeah. wide receiver. So right, big, and yeah. so – with with Gesicki, it's not that he's not a good player. It's that in this offense that is trying to establish an identity of running the football for the first time into his NFL career to take the pressure off of him, he's a tell at this point. And, you know, unless he becomes a serviceable run blocker, it's hard to see where he fits in. 
Well, and you know, you look at the big picture of of what you learn in the preseason too. Gasicki's one of the focal points, I think, as far as what we're learning about this team as what they may or may not be able to do with certain players and positions. I think also when you look back, Tyreek Hill is a superstar. You know what you got. You gave up a lot for him. You didn't have a first round pick. You had all these things you had to give up for it. Totally worth it to get a player of his caliber. But when you look at the picks, you know, that they did make, and you look at a couple of the players that have stood out so far, you, know, you this is the second straight week that we're talking about Skylar Thompson. And yep. Eric Azukama as well, you know, he's a guy that, that they draft a little earlier, obviously, than Thompson. But these are two players that all of a sudden you're looking at. And Azukama more so than Thompson, because Thompson, you've got, you know, you've got your starting quarterback in Tua and you've got your 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 veteran backup in Bridgewater. But you've seen two players shine, you know. Last week you called it the, uh, the Skylar Thompson show. It continued. The Skylar Thompson show continued. I'm buying into what I see with this kid. He's really impressive. Let's start with him, Clay. Is it silly to think that this you may have found something in Skylar Thompson? No, it's it's not at all silly. I, I think the – and again, we get back to having good problems to have, right? You only have 53 guys that you can keep on the active roster. And Mike McDaniel talked about that, that he didn't like to pigeonhole himself into keeping certain numbers. you got to mm-hmm. keep the best 53. Will, they may have to carry three quarterbacks because oh, I, I think, think they, they have to. let this guy leave the building. I, yeah, I they just, have to blown away by him and you know it's it's not saying that you don't think Tua can be the guy but my goodness look at what quality quarterbacks can get you in a trade return if eventually like let's say Tua becomes a pro bowl maybe even all pro level quarterback let's say the sky is the limit but let's say he hits his ceiling man look at what uh, San Francisco gave up originally for for Jimmy Garoppolo I mean you you look around what teams are willing to give up for really good quarterbacks and oh by the way look let's say Teddy Bridgewater ends up going somewhere else you know to finish off his career man you want to have somebody that can win you some football games if Mm -hmm. if Tua does have to miss some time because of injury so no I don't think that it's it's overreacting because Will I've seen other backup quarterbacks in this preseason. I've, I've watched Ian Book for the for the Saints. I mean, this is the guy. I mean, Dolphins fans saw him last year, and in that in that game in the Superdome, mm-hmm. uh, and he was. You could excuse his performance in that game. He's not been good in the pre. You don't just wake up and play how Skylar Thompson has played. No, 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 no. In That's... in in this preseason, he's got something, and yeah. you know, it, it, I, I like what I've heard about him too. Where very inquisitive somebody who's who's always asked okay well why did you do this what did you see here Tua was talking about uh, the way he interacts so he's somebody who really wants to get better he clearly has the physical skill set he clearly makes quick decisions so far we understand but the skill set is there regardless of the competition level the skill set is there and i i don't think you can afford to put him on the practice squad and lose him I look at it this way, and it's something you said earlier. I'm going to tell you right now what it is. This is what it is. Because of what you said, it gave me this, and I and I give go. this to you. No, this is this is for you. This is a live live podcasting. Uh oh. Already. Drum roll, please. There's nothing better than. The Skyler is uh... the limit. The Skyler is the limit. We need to have the prices right. <laughs> this kid is impressive I, and i've gotten to the point where you look at mike mcdaniel what he's what he's working with you know last week we talked about well what if if he can make a guy like this look good what is he going to do with Tua, right well i think we got to give Skylar thompson a little more credit i'm not going to sit here and over exaggerate from two preseason games and say this guy's a starting quarterback at the nfl in the future but i'm not not going to i mean i i think he could very well be the kind of player that in the right system and you see players along the league develop. Not every starting quarterback in the NFL is a first round pick. Not every right. starting quarterback in the NFL was a blue chip prospect that everybody expected to be a starter. Last week, I compared him a bit like maybe he's going to have a, a career like a Colt McCoy or Ryan Fitzpatrick or that kind of quarterback that bounces around and is a good backup. But maybe, just maybe, he's going to be more than that. And I think his poise in the pocket, his his ability to make throws in the tight windows, you see something in him that looks more than just a seventh round pick who's kind of going through the motions and possibly fighting for a job in training camp. He looks like a player who can actually really develop and not saying we see Aaron Rodgers, not saying we see Patrick Mahomes, but I think the Dolphins have really found something in him. And I think that's something that you take away from this preseason. Now, the people that have been tweeting at me, I'm sure you as well, and saying, oh, do a better watch his back. He's going to get benched. 
Tua Tungvalu is not getting benched for Skylar Thompson. The only way Tua Tungvalu is ever getting benched is if he struggles or gets hurt. And by the way, if he does, Teddy Bridgewater is playing. And the only way Skylar Thompson ever sees the game is if there's a lot of injuries in that office of, you know, for, for that quarterback room. But I do think that from a development standpoint, it's one of the better storylines so far uh, that has happened with this team right now because he is looking like an NFL quarterback. He looks comfortable, and I think you found something there. Well, and I, I, I'm going to look it up right now, what Teddy Bridgewater's salary is, because this is another, in a salary cap league, this is mm. super important. If you have a seventh-round pick on your roster that you're comfortable oh, yeah. as your backup quarterback, and I'm looking right now, so he signed a one-year, $6.5 million contract. Six and a half million dollars in the NFL and uh, under your salary cap, like you cut that down to what a seventh round pick is making. I mean, that's yeah. there's more to having a quarterback, a backup quarterback that you have a lot of faith in than just oh, well, hey, he's a seventh round pick and and you know maybe he's able to start a game mm-hmm. or two. You're talking about salary cap implications. Eventually, you're going to have to pay a starting quarterback, maybe, maybe to a who's still on his rookie deal. Maybe he does prove yeah. to be. A, a franchise type quarterback, you're going to have to pay him like that. You know, you see the deal that Kyler Murray just got. You're going to be trying to squeeze nickels wherever you can underneath the salary yeah. cap. And so, I mean, a seventh round, a seventh round quarterback is just not. You don't find those on trades. He's just yeah. pennies. So, so I mean, again, that's there's so much value in having, even if Skylar Thompson just develops into a a serviceable to good backup quarterback as a seventh round pick. It's good There's enough a for a seventh yeah. value in that. And if he turns into something more than that, you flip him for a, a second round pick, maybe even more than that. I mean, these are the things that when you see a quarterback play like that, you don't just think, oh, this guy is going to take to his job. No, you think where what other value can he provide mm-hmm. By being on this roster, and, and Will, there's a lot. So I, I, there's a reason to feel really good about what you've seen and, and what he could do in the future. Erica Zucama, what do you think? I, I like it, and, and what I what I what I like to see is when players do in preseason games what we've seen in training camp. And he's a guy that just he has this sense of getting open. He has this good sense body of control. Making, by the way, really I, nice body control. I was going to say the contested he. Now, still a lot of raw there. You know, there's still still some refinement that can happen. But, man, you talk about a, a developmental-type prospect and a guy that can really go out there. I like what I've seen out of Trent Shurfield. I mean, that, yeah. this is – and, again, this gets back to the Mike Gesicki conversation where you have so many guys who you're comfortable, confident in as receivers – that having a tight end making $10 million that you're just going to kick out and play at wide receiver. It's doesn't not make a whole your lot of style. Sense. Yeah. Doesn't. So and anyway, not, not to, not to go up, go back on, on what's potentially negative. I mean, it's a positive, but it, it, because you have so many of these receivers, like you feel so good about that room. I mean, we, we already talked about Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, Cedric Wilson's a name we barely even mentioned to this point. And I think he's somebody who can, can contribute to the who are your four receivers. Who are your, first, who are your first four receivers? So obviously Hill and Waddle. And then you get Cedric oh. Wilson. Who's four? Is it Azukama? I mean, who's your fourth receiver? It's tough. Cause I really like what I've seen out of Lynn Bowden. I Sherfield, I, I Sherfield just has this way of getting open and it, there's just like a, there's a savviness to what he does. So maybe it comes down to what you do on special teams, but mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to want to, you drafted as a comment. You're not going to want to find a yeah. way. You're not, you're not going to want to Yeah. As so, a is a guy that I think is the four, I think uh, Bowden and Hammer right there. The next two. Yeah, I, really do. I, I, I think so too. So I, anyway, all that to say, you get back to the good problem to have. And it's like, man, you look at a, at a wide receiver room and you compare it to what they've had in the past year. Oh, it's and, not a comparison. Man. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you give, yeah. you give Mike McDaniel a lot of credit because clearly he got together with Chris Greer and said, look, we need to fill these spots. And in, in order for our offense to run effectively and, and efficiently, we need to be able to have guys who can go out there and, and play receiver. And, and yeah, you want to have those explosive playmakers, mm-hmm. but you want to have other players who can go out there and, and get the job done. And they've, they've clearly done that in a way that we haven't seen done here in Miami yeah. for a while. Perfect example is a couple of years ago, we were having conversations and fans were as well as whether Preston Williams could be a number one, right? Or yeah. Number two. Isn't Preston Williams. 
He's a, we haven't even mentioned him in this conversation. And by in the way, with good reason, because he doesn't even, he doesn't fit. He's not like those other guys that we've talked about. Maybe talent wise, the talent is there, but as far as the, what he can do on the field and the production, uh, we hadn't even mentioned him. So that tells you how much the receiver room has changed in the last couple of years. And obviously immediately with Waddle getting Waddle last year, getting Hill this year, it's just a whole different offensive dynamic. Clay, I want to end the Dolphin talk by talking about the, you know, what would be your plan for the preseason finale? You've seen a lot of injuries around the league. You're seeing some headaches <laughs> around the league. Would you just say, hey, shut it down, play yep. the kids, and let's move on to game one? Yeah, and and again, this is that would have been me last week too, and that's where I can understand people that want to see them go out there and play, and you pay money for the tickets, and I, I get all that especially this week with having the joint practices with Philly, mm -hmm. I would assume you're going to get a lot more good on good work in, in this week of practice with Philly. And I would leave it at that. I, I just feel like when you've got the benefit of, of in a, a controlled setting, seeing the starters and, and knocking the rust off and putting them in situations that can simulate a real game against real competition yeah. better than, yeah, under the lights in front of a crowd, but against second string, third string, not controlled. I just like this setting so much. I do too. So you asked my plan, Will. I would, I would lay it all out there for the joint practices. I would pull back for the preseason game. I would go all in on the joint practices, protect your quarterback, but then for the preseason game, I'd, I'd be done with it. I, yeah. I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even think about it. I have long time, and, and I've mentioned it to you last week, I've long time been a fan of getting preseason action. I still am. As long as there's preseason games, I think at least one of those games your starting unit should get. Uh, you know, a, a couple drives, uh, maybe even a quarter, depending on how that that first quarter goes. I think what we saw from Tua, and given that you know, if, if he didn't play Tyreek Hill, Big Daniel didn't play Tyreek Kill in Week Two, he's not going to play him in Week Three. So Hill is not playing till Week One of the regular season. A Waddle with his injury situation, there's no need to risk it. It's a minor thing. There's no need to risk it. He's going to go to Week One. Raheem Mostert, who's coming back from injury, didn't play in this one. I have a feeling that it's the same plan. He feels good that he has Chase Edmonds as we talk now, hopefully remains healthy going into the season and most could kind of work his way in, whether it be to be the full-time back or split back with Edmonds, whatever the case may be. Point being, I think we've seen enough from that to Ron Armstead managing his injury history, making sure he's fresh and ready for the regular season. I think to your point on joint practices, I really think that there's going to be a day where we may not have preseason games anymore, yeah. where it may just be joint practices where fans pay to watch joint practices during the week. Maybe a couple of them, you, you pay a ticket, you see your favorite players, you get a few autographs. It's great. A little more intimate setting. I understand the money part of it because preseason games still make money and you have broadcast deals and all that stuff, but they're becoming pretty useless. Uh, the yep. way coaches are coaching them and I get young players get to play. It's cool. But for the sake of what a team wants to be, they're really not serving much purpose right now. Certainly not for the, the players that you're going to see when it matters in a few weeks in week one. All right, so that's the Dolphins conversation. I want to take a moment to talk about something else that happened, and that is the return of Udonis Haslam. UD back for 20th season with the Miami Heat. It is his final season. So I would call it the last dance. This isn't like Dwayne Wade. This is it. But I was happy for one to see him make this announcement because I, I love UD. I think that anybody who's a Heat fan loves UD. And can I say something, Clay? I'm tired, so tired of this theory, right, that Udonis Haslam is, is screwing up the Heat and he's holding back a young developmental player because he keeps coming back and now he's coming back again for one final season. Let me just say it as clear as day. He made the announcement there at his alma mater, Miami Senior High, during one of his foundation events, a kids camp and cheer camp. He's coming back. His dad, who passed away about a year ago, uh, he had promised and they'd long discussed that he'd play a 20th season. His dad would be there on the court for the final games. And obviously that's eating away at UD because with his dad gone, that's not possible. But he wanted to kind of finish that dream and give that to his dad. But what I want to tell fans is this. Udonis Haslam is not holding anybody back. And if you think that you're, I mean, it's ridiculous to think that. He's not holding anybody back. This is something the Miami Dolphins want, or the Miami uh, Heat want. They want Udonis Haslam as part of their organization as a player because his role near the end of the bench is, is something that is not coaching. Coaching is breaking down film, scouting, devising game plans, in-game timeout management and schemes. What a team's doing. When do you want to go to zone? All those things. And Haslam, when you look at what he is for this team, he's a hard worker behind the scenes, in the weight room, on the court, pushing players, giving it his all, the sweat, as he says, blood, sweat, tears, all that stuff for his team. So while I can admit that Udonis Haslam is not an impactful player anymore 
on the court as a player, the Heat value that much more than they would some other veteran that maybe gives you a few extra minutes or young player who's well far off. Udonis Haslam has had a much to do with the development of these players that we're mentioning as, as anyone, as anyone on those teams, because he's been there with them to teach them the work ethic behind the scenes, what it's like. That's not what coaches do. That's what players do. And in a veteran player's case like UD, he's doing it for one last round. And I, and I can't imagine that anybody should ever have a problem with that because I know the Heat don't. It, it just always boggles my mind that people think they know better than what's going on inside that. Yeah, he's holding, and, and he's, he, he's holding him hostage. <laughs> he can't tell UD to go. He can't tell UD to go, and they, they just feel bad for him. So they're just or, – or not, yeah, not feel bad for him. They just feel like they're – Pat Riley just has his heartstrings. So let me yeah. get this straight. Let me get this straight. The man who let Dwayne Wade walk out of the building yep. for a couple million extra dollars is too sentimental <laughs> to let you the man. The man who looked at uh, LeBron James and said, "You go play for that coach and shut up," basically because yeah. you don't want you don't want Eric Spolster too bad. That's our head coach. And now all of a sudden, for Udonis Haslam, he's gonna get on his knees and say, "Oh, forget it. I don't go." Pat Riley would cut his own mother off the team if yeah, it gave them a better chance to win a championship. Yeah. So yeah. you don't know better than he does when it comes to this specific thing because you don't know the value that he adds. The, the one thing that, that the more you're, you're in this business, well, I know you can kind of attest to this, you, you learn more about what you don't know than what you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that, that I wish I could tell my younger self is, Quit like acting like you know something because you don't and you have no clue what goes on inside those buildings. And so if they thought that it was better for the organization to gently escort him out as it a player, happened. they would happened. find a way to do that. But it's not the case. There's a They'd lot tell of too bad. That clearly adds. They would yes. tell him too bad. They would say, you do. Yes. We love you. You'll always be a part of our organization, but you got to go. I mean, that's what they would say to him. You think that they be, that they're not saying that? that they believe that, but they're afraid and they want you to know they know the value of him and they value. It. So anyways, I just want to get that off my chest because I'm happy UD is coming back and we'll talk more basketball. It, it's, it's incredible that here we are clay in, in mid to late August, right? And football season is about to start and training camp at the NBA starts in about a month or so, a little over a month. Yeah. And the biggest heat news we've had is that Udonis is coming back and that's not a shot at UD. That's a shot at how quiet the off season has been that we thought We'd be talking KD and Donovan Mitchell, and we have just to fill time, but none of it has come to fruition. None of it is actually happening, which is, I don't want to use the word shocking, but it's certainly surprising. It, it's uh, reading between the, the tea leaves, and I was, I was actually going back and forth with our, our morning anchor, Eric Yutzi, about this. And so, like, you try, to, you try to piece together the things that have gone on because the Celtics posted a whole bunch of pictures today of Jalen Brown. And it was like, this is a little bit too much of a coincidence given the things that have come out over the last so yeah, that's true my view on how this whole thing has happened will was i don't think brooklyn wanted to trade kevin durant at the beginning i think they were throwing out these crazy uh oh no we want eight draft picks we want your best player we want this and they were basically sending offers out to teams that were ridiculous and maybe jalen brown's name was floated but then i think over the last couple of weeks or so they started to get a little serious. And I think that's when Jalen Brown's name just happened to be floated at 3 a.m. to both Woj and Yeah, John. it was bizarre. Yeah. And, and it was like it was like they finally realized, oh, uh-oh, we got to figure something out with this. And then Kevin Durant goes in there and says, no, you either fire Steve Nash and, and, and Sean Marks, yeah. or I still want out of here and I want out of here bad. And now they're left in this. So I think what's happened with that situation is Brooklyn has botched it. I mean, it's been botched from the beginning. It felt Fair. like they didn't want to trade him. And then now they're kind of in the situation where they've uh, shown that they have no leverage whatsoever. And teams are kind of like, oh, really? Okay, well, now what? Uh, we know that you're not getting offers from anybody else. So why should we put our best package on the table? And as far as Donovan Mitchell goes, Will, everybody knows he's, he's going to end up with the Knicks. And it's just a matter of time before Danny I really, I really think I'm at that point. Yeah, I'm at I, that I, point too. And right. it's, the Heat can't match what the Knicks could eventually offer. So where, wherever the Heat are willing to go, the Knicks are going to beat it. And so I, th I think the Heat probably haven't even had much, many conversations with Utah because they know it's, it's fruitless at this point. So that's where all that is at. I, I don't think this Heat roster is going to look remotely the same. I shouldn't say remotely the same. 
there's going to be a big addition or two by the trade deadline. I don't know that it's going to be in camp, but they know, they have to know that they can't go into this, the the playoffs, the later part of the season and the postseason Mm -hmm. with Caleb Martin as your starting four or with playing Jimmy Butler at the four for a significant period of time. They have to know that something will give. Something will give. You know, at some point, the league is waiting on the Kevin Durant domino. I think that's, and I think Miami is certainly among those teams. And then once that situation is resolved, then I think whatever big offseason news we thought would happen, whatever the big move is that they can make, I think will ultimately get made. I've been asked a lot the last two weeks from Heat fans, uh, run into them in places or, you know, again, on social media asking me, well, why haven't the Heat made a move? Are they going to make a move? And I, to your point of the answer is, is similar to what I've said to them. It's like, look, just because the Heat don't make a move now doesn't mean that they think that they have a roster that's going to take them to a championship because yep. make no mistake about it. That's where they want to be. They don't want to be a shot short. They don't want to regress and go even backwards and be a first one and done or a second round team. They want to finish what they started last year, get there. And I think within they know while running it back is not a bad thing, but running it back could certainly keep them near the top of the East and, and a competitive team to finish what they started last year. They need help. They need something else that something else will likely come. It's just not going to come right now. It looks like whether that Durant domino falls and then it starts maybe, but it's, you know, there is a plan for that next step. And to your point, Will, that how, how many times did they tell us how valuable PJ Tucker was, how much they loved him? They're not running it back because they're bringing back the same team minus PJ Tucker. Yeah. So you, you lost a player that you said was extremely valuable This is not the plan. The plan is not to bring back last year's team minus P.J. Tucker. I think everybody, and I think in particular Miami, is waiting on the Kevin Durant domino. And then whether he's traded or the situation is resolved or the Heat are clear that they are not going to be able to match another team's best offer, they're going to wait for that. The second that happens, they'll either have Kevin Durant or they'll move on to whatever the next plan is. Yeah, and look, and I think there is also going to be a a, – I think the truth will come out of what this roster is as the season goes on. If you open up with a roster that's similar to the construction they have right now, as the first couple months pass, you're going to say, okay, so what is Victor Oladipo? Is he truly back to being what he was before and can take that next step and make you better? What is Caleb Martin over extended periods of time and not just in certain spots? What do you have in Omer Yurtsevin? Is, is, is he someone that actually could entice a person to along if whether Tyler Hero is the big piece to throw in a big body like Omer. I mean, these are things that I think while they remain competitive the first few months, you'll kind of find out. And if by December, January, Oladipo's averaging 20 a game and he looks like the old Oladipo and Caleb Martin's a force and playing well and Yurtsman's getting you good minutes and Tyler's still that great six man, whether he's starting, whatever the case may be, then I think you get a better picture of your assets and a better idea of what you're maybe needing to fill from this is not like it's a bad team. I mean, let's not act like the Heat are a bad team. They're just a team that was on the cusp of playing for a championship that now looks like they've sort of sort of gone, like you said, I don't want to say regress, but certainly kind of flatlined a bit. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not a team that you look and say, wow, they've gotten significantly better. I don't think anybody could tell you that with a straight face. So I think that's the next step. Find out what you have and go from there. It's a team that's good enough to win games while you figure out what the next move is. And, yeah, and I, I, it- I just, I, and that's why I think they're going to go as long as they can, just kind of keeping the ship afloat, staying as close as they can to, to the top two or three seeds in the East with this current roster. And then once you know what's available to you, yeah. whether it's Kevin Durant, Donovan Mitchell, uh, Jalen Brown ended up in that, in that Kevin Durant yeah. trade and they wanted, Brooklyn wanted to flip him, whatever it is, you can win games with this team until you figure that out. But but you not, are not championships. Going to win a championship yeah. with this no, team. I agree but with Will, you. And this goes back to what I was saying with you, about UD. If you're a fan sitting at home and you know that, I guarantee you Pat Riley knows it. I guarantee you Andy Ellisberg knows it. They're working on oh, this. Oh, they just, yeah, of course. It's just non-stop. not there yet. Yeah, yeah, they're not going to sit there and come out and say, I don't think it's a good enough team. We, we screwed up the offseason when things haven't gone to plan. I don't think any of that's true. I don't think they've screwed up anything. I think just the, the offseason has been a very quiet, uncharacteristically quiet offseason. But trust me, there will be moves that will be made. And as you said, it could be right around the deadline, maybe before. But Heat Basketball is right around the corner, and Udonis Hassan will be a part of it. You can always reach me at Will Manso. You see it there. Clay's at Clay WPLG. Always appreciate you listening to the Miami Sports Pod. We'll be back next week as we look ahead to the regular season with the Dolphins' final preseason game.